Good afternoon. My name is Tim Grapes, lead architect for the IGES Architect and the IGES Institute and manager of the IGES Springboard Program. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the IGES Institute's webinar entitled Advancing Mission Critical Information Sharing Standards Adoption, Springboard Testing and Certification. The purpose of this webinar is to educate about, about the IGES Institute's Springboard Program and its new cybersecurity offering, Cyber Standards Check. The webinar includes an overview of the Springboard program, a discussion of the cybersecurity market, an overview of Cyber Standards Check, and a Cyber Standards Check demonstration. Before we begin, here's a couple of out housekeeping items. The audience is muted during the presentation. Audience questions will be taken follow at the end following the demonstration. If you type into the questions box on the right, we'll get to as many questions as possible. If we don't get to every question, we will respond back to you. You may also at the end use the raised hand icon to be unmuted and ask questions. Our speakers today include from the IGES Institute, Ashwini Jarrell, Executive Director, and from our partners from Fifth Column, David Giambruno, Dimitri Slaviak, and David Murray. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ashwini Jarrell. Thanks, Tim. Um, good afternoon. So um, before we um, get started in talking about the IGES Institute Springboard program and also our new offering on cybersecurity standards conformance, I want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, who the IGES Institute is. Um, so the IGES Institute um, is a nonprofit. We are 501c3. Uh, we are a membership-based organization. Uh, our, our membership includes uh, members from technology industry, but also uh, we have associate members uh, from federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial government. Our mission is to enable technology in the public sector and also expand the use of information sharing to maximize safety and ensuring the proper use of information um, within the mission. Our focus areas uh, include uh, criminal justice, as some of you might not know, that the IGES Institute was started with a focus on uh, law enforcement. Um, since our inception uh, in 2001, uh, we have actually uh, supported um, different mission partners in criminal justice. Uh, we have now expanded our reach into public safety where we are very actively doing a lot of work to support the fire and EMS and emergency management community. Uh, we are actively engaged in some of the information sharing efforts and the technology innovation at Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, and also uh, transportation. At IGES Institute, we strongly believe that through information sharing and proper use of technology that you can serve the mission community and enhance the citizens' experience by leveraging the core set of information that are needed uh, to serve the public. At IGES Institute, uh, we have been very actively engaged in developing some of the standards around information sharing. For example, the IGES Institute was very instrumental in developing the Global Justice XML data model, national information exchange model, and then also looking at some of the global standards that are out there and in use in justice and public safety community. We strongly believe uh, in open standards that promote broader adoption to achieve interoperability and information sharing. And as you can see on this, this particular slide, that we believe in standards and our membership believes in the standards and the use of the standard because it's not just being more cost effective, but it also is about achieving interoperability and making the mission partners more efficient and effective in not only leveraging the technology and being successful in using those technology, but also sharing the data in a timely manner and a reliable data. As we all know that uh, within our different set of missions and the solutions that uh, we sell uh, to the buying community, uh, there's a lot of information that is collected, but we wanna make sure that when the information is needed to serve uh, and respond uh, to an incident that the first responders or the mission folks have the right set of information to address the need of citizens and to address some of the concerns that they have while addressing some of the incident management concepts. Uh, it also reduces error, but above and 
we are looking at increasing efficiencies across not just within the government sector, but also achieving efficiencies within the uh, solutions that are being developed and deployed by some of our uh, membership. With that, I will turn it to Tim Graves to talk about um, the springboard and the value of standards. Thank you, Ashwini. And I'll underscore that information sharing and justice, public safety, and homeland security organizations, just as Ashwini said, is mission critical. We hear claims of compliance with open specifications and open standards, but how do we know that the implementation of technology does in fact comply and better interoperate with others? So this slide, I just is not another standards development organization. We work with SDOs, um, work on SDO committees and working groups. We work with industry and their customers to advance standards adoption and use the Springboard program to validate their use. So this slide shows some of those SDOs and standards that we work with. Under OASIS, we, we have the electronic course filing standard that we work with. You also hear, see here the tracking of emergency patient standard. Um, also within the EDXL family of standards, we work with hospital availability exchange and the distribution element, which is used to distribute the entire family of EDXL standards. Under NINA, National Emergency Numbering Association, we see the EIDD, which is the Emergency Incident Data Definition. That's a standard for CAD-CAD incident calls. We also work with, the, with NINA to incorporate the text of 911 into their next generation 911 standards as part of a program that we're working on now. Uh, NIST, there are many different types of standards under NIST, and we'll talk about cybersecurity testing uh, shortly and the standards that apply with NIST. Um, also listed here is NEEM, the National Inf Information Exchange Model. While NEEM defines data and data structures and provides tools to help define information exchanges, we still need a method of validating information and, and implementation conformance. So how do we help ensure that standards conformance actually happens? It's by testing against the actual specification or standard. Springboard's mission is to advance justice, public safety and homeland security information sharing and technology integration and compatibility. Springboard's objective is to provide a venue to engage in partnerships that drive the adoption and the use of national information sharing and information sharing standards. Meeting this objective requires a proven, repeatable approach to help industry, government, and practitioners apply open standards and a process and a technical framework to test and certify their use. The IGES Springboard Certification Program is an independent standards-based interoperability testing and certification program, again, targeted for industry and government implementations. Springboard program provides three basic components. First is a repeatable testing process and certification program, typically involving formation of a working group involving the three organizations that, that we've mentioned to you already, SDOs, industry, and practitioners. Secondly, a cloud-based platform with remote access used both as a sandbox for industry to test their solutions and get it right, and then secondly, to perform certification testing. And thirdly, a test harness or conformance specification, which is typically made up of scenarios, use cases, test cases, et cetera, designed specifically for the standard or specification being tested. So why should industry and practitioners engage in the Springboard program for their solution? First of all, results are openly publicized. That includes a conformance report, certification award, and it includes product information and capabilities. Secondly, having a pre-certified repeatable data exchange solution actually accelerates testing and maintenance versus, versus what's often uh, the case of many different versions of various custom interfaces that have to be maintained internally. The transparency provided through this publication helps to inform customer purchase decisions when looking at a proven entity versus the claims of others. I just offers a low cost to participate 
and ultimately this supports the underlying goal of increased effectiveness, responsiveness, and transparency of public safety and information sharing. So to touch on a couple of springboard success stories, the Georgia Administrative Office of the Courts certified their product against the OASIS ECF, which is the Electronic Courts Filing Standard, that time version 4.0.1. Their solution was used to connect courts throughout the state of Georgia. The state of Indiana Supreme Court Division of Court Administration performed the same conformance testing with their vendor, Tyler Technologies. And a third example for the Prescription Drug, Mon Drug Monitoring Program Information Exchange, that's referred to as PMIX or PDMP. This is a multi-state data exchange using the vendor APRIS. Conformance testing was performed against their own specification. And in fact, we're currently planning another round of conform conformance testing for 27 PDMP sites. And each site represents a state. And we plan to finish that testing by a year in. So I've touched on some of this a moment ago, but planned conformance testing that we have. NINA I3 next generation 911 specification has an RFI out that IDIS is engaged. We're also working with text to 911, as well as the NINA EIDD standard. OASIS is ready to publish their, their, their uh, this year ready to publish the version five ECF standard. Also the OASIS tracking emergency patients and hospital availability standards, which I mentioned before, are now jointly released by both OASIS and HL7. In addition, both of those organizations have co-sponsored a transformation specification, which moves data from emergency scene or EMS through TEP to hospital systems that use, H use HL7. And we're looking at conformance testing for an upcoming project involving those standards. The National Crime Statistics Exchange provides NIBRS data to the FBI. NIBRS stands for the National Incident-Based Reporting System. We're planning conformance testing for the state of California in 2019. And finally, the topic of the second half of our webinar, Application Source Code Security Testing, applying the NIST Special Publication 800-53, part of the NIST Risk Management Framework. Before I hand off to our next presenter, I'd like to introduce the IGIS Institute's new springboard offering in partnership with Fifth Column LLC, Cyber Standards Check. Cyber Standards Check is a simple, secure, and affordable application source code security testing tool. It helps protect applications by monitoring code environments and reporting vulnerabilities. Now, this sounds like nothing new, but as we continue our webinar, we'll discuss more about how Cyber Standards Check stacks up against higher priced tools in the commercial market today and is designed with government and public safety needs in mind. It's meant to accommodate any size agency fitting into the tight cybersecurity budgets. Another key difference compared with other tools is that it helps users with NIST 800-53 by building in and automating testing for its software security controls. Cyber Standards Check is remotely accessed. It's very simple and inexpensive to deploy and use, and it provides continuous scanning and reporting of vulnerabilities, recommendations for remediation, and then ongoing going security progress as fixes are applied through a personal dashboard. Ultimately, our goal is to make this tool broadly available so that any state, local, or federal agency can minimize their software security burden. And now I'd like to turn the stage over to David Giambruto of Fifth Column to share more information about the cybersecurity landscape and more about this offering. David. So David Giambruno here, how are you? Um, so I come with a, a background uh, protecting big brands, you know, companies like Revlon, media companies, and, and through that, I've learned a bunch of stuff. Um, and so, through Fifth Column, uh, we provide a full service information technology company centered on next generation cyber threats and analysis for enterprise security data. Uh, we are true technology partners who take the time to understand your business or your situation and build a strategy to mitigate that around breaches, ensure system reliability and across the entire enterprise.
we look at things through a, a threat life cycle, uh, particularly around advanced persistent threat attacks that are typically predefined set of phases that acts as a signature, um, also commonly referred to as a kill chain. So the standard steps are reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and actions on target. So one of the things that we do is we have, uh, from our perspective, key market differentiators around a unified interface for logging and automated analysis to pinpoint infections through our platform called BOSS. Point in time re reporting, which we call threat per threat threat to practice, uh, sorry. Um, and that enables a deep and wide view to what's going on. We provide security operation centers 24 by seven for intelligence gathering, monitoring networks and communicating back to your organizations. Interrogation of networks, leveraging learned intelligence and behavioral analysis by our cyber experts, our certified engineers with partners and customers. And we do that through a shadow box and we provide managed services through our certified professional services. We meet all the gover governance requirements and we're ready to use within 24 hours. And that's a very common theme for us is uh, speed to value. Um, so as I was saying before, I've learned a lot doing security for almost 20 years and I have a golden rule of cybersecurity. And it's basically all things considered equal, you are less secure tomorrow than you were today. There's more patches, there's more vulnerabilities in your infrastructure application, your code and web. With bugs, what was secure yesterday may not be tomorrow. Viruses, APTs, malware, there's more tomorrow and different attack vectors. Um, you know, everybody talks about people, but uh, attack vectors change through technical and social engineering so fast that training can never keep up and humans make mistakes. And essentially one of our philosophies is to help people and corporations, government entities to essentially bubble wrap themselves so A, people can't hurt themselves and stop the attacks. And hackers and attacks change every day. Uh, I've spent a lot of time talking to government agencies, board of directors and the number one question I'm always asked as I've been in business leader and boards is why is am I, why am I a target for a cyber threat, right? At the end of the day, it's because you have a computer, right? You, hackers use your stuff uh, to host themselves. They don't pay for data centers. They hold your files for ransom and get paid for it. They use your hardware to mine cryptocurrency, which is now the number one attack vector. It's exceeding ransomware. They use your infrastructure to attack others. Uh, they sell your information and watching and respond to chaos is fun for them. But at the end of the day, it's really because you have a, uh, you have a computer and they're going to figure out how to use it. Some of the fun things that I've heard, right? And I always use sarcasm as a teaching. So I've actually had these things said to me. I had a CISO. If I don't know about it, I'm not responsible for it. Uh, we outsource security, so we're not responsible and we have someone to blame. Why do I need to do inventory? We don't scan or patch because it's too hard. We just use usernames with no passwords. Had a VP of applications says checking our code for vulnerability isn't necessary. Had coders say, I don't know how to fix it. I just copied it. And a VP of a security operation center, we get too many alerts and we just turn off all the alerting. And it's called the, you know, generally it's the art of accountability avoidance. And so part of my philosophy is really making that easy for people to understand and manage their security landscape. Uh, some of the things that I find really interesting are is in the NSA, they just released this. In the past two years, no breach is from a zero day attack. What that means is all attacks are, have been from known vulnerabilities. Um, according to Warren Buffett, cyber attacks are the biggest threat to mankind, even greater than nuclear weapons. Uh, we're seeing that resonate both in uh, industry and geopolitical environments. Uh, seven out of 10 organizations say their risk has increased significantly in the past two years. Worldwide security spending will reach 96 billion in 2018. It's got, I just came back from Gartner. It's there. Uh, one third of organizations believe they have adequate, they uh, have adequate years to manage security effectively. And crypto miners are now impacting 55% of organizations globally. And 70 to 80% of all cyber issues can be eliminated with simple hygiene. 
I say simple, it's a lot of work, but it is not the sophisticated attacks that are winning, it's the simple things. So one of the things I try and point out is the physics of cybersecurity and the mandate that the tools and automation have to be at your core. So this is an actual example of 30 days of vulnerabilities for a large multinational, which was 50,000 pages of vulnerabilities. So in each one of those pages are lots of vulnerabilities, and that's every month. There's no way you can write tickets to pack that and track each one. The math doesn't work. So you have to automate the response and make it easy. Uh, we have a world moving to code. And so these are the things I've learned in defending is deploy, deploy a real WAF. So that's a web application firewall. So you can see how people are attacking your code to continuously scan your code. Um, you know, you have the CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment software for Agile. I add on to continuously scan. If you're not doing that, Agile will be challenging and you're going to be creating security risks to constantly scan your applications. And the last thing is back your stuff up because even in Agile and cloud-based, nothing is ephemeral as you think it is. Um, and you want to connect what the hackers are attacking to the code you are writing. That is one of the biggest lessons we've seen. With the advent of cloud platforms, you know, AWS, Google, uh, people are moving there. They have great infrastructure. It's much harder to attack. So the hackers are now moving to code because the majority of people don't scan their code. So one of the things that's really interesting and, you know, is code appropriation. So we see that as one of the biggest challenges out there in the market. So coders are now copying code, not generating their own or bothering to understand what they're taking. And that creates significant dependencies in codes and frameworks. And, but the impact is coders don't understand how to begin addressing a vulnerability. And it's important to understand the difference between writing code and integrating a framework. And we'll talk about that a little more, but uh, when we look about remediation and the challenges, it's providing the coders, you know, the framework of how do I fix this? So again, global crime, you know, will double from 3 trillion to 6 trillion per year from 2015 to 21. You hear about, um, you know, uh, digital transformation. Coders have done it. They're now getting specialized and attacking and it's paying for itself. They're making a lot of money and it's only getting worse. So uh, one of the thing, the platform that we helped uh, create, which is um, powered by Nucleus. So Nucleus um, has a simple mission statement, which is the world is turning to code and we're making code security simple, approachable, affordable, and actionable. The vision was really, you know, what, make easy what was hard, enable anyone to continually understand this code security posture, and communicate that or report that in a consumable manner against all the major security frameworks. So the first one out of the gate is really around NIST for conformance and scanning and remediating code through Nucleus console as an example, and creating a platform that connects the problem with the solutions to enable a rich community of action and help teams and actionable information to continuously improve. And again, disrupt the current code security platforms out there by making it, again, simple and approachable. Um, the, the major ethos of all of this is, you know, the team that designed and built this came from large corporate and the effort to deploy this was hard. And so the whole ethos is just making this simple, approachable and affordable for everyone to scan their code while the world changes. So, what cyber standards check does, right? What does it do? It really scans code repositories for vulnerabilities and code and dependencies or the frameworks in an approachable and affordable actual manager, essentially disrupting the market. Simply up and operational in three steps in 30 minutes. The value is actionable information in 30 minutes from scan results at a price that enables the company to secure the code. Continuously scan repositories, automated scanning schedules out of the box, uh, scalable from one to thousands of repos. Um, there's thousands of repos in the platform right now being scanned every day and compliance. So NIST mapping and conformance. So who's the customer? It's essentially anyone who's writing code, right? So governments, companies, agencies, platforms, 
consultants and millions of developers who want to ensure code delivered is secure and continuously monitored, protect platforms for customers, contributors, vendors, and product teams, ensure compliance and conformance to commercial regulatory requirements, you know, both internally, external, business partners, NIST, and uh, shortly the, it'll be OWASP as well. So conservatively, we support eight out of the most popular languages on GitHub. GitHub is arguably the industry standard for hosting code. Um, there's also 73 frameworks with more coming. Uh, the current languages are Node, JS, and um, Python, PHP, Java, Ruby, Flex, and Go. So product capabilities simply is around detection, detects vulnerabilities in your code repos using multiple scanning technologies. So it's not just one scanner, it's whole whole slew of scanners going through the code. Identifies repos that need uh, remediation, real-time alerts, NIST conformance alerting, and auto-scheduled scans to meet compliance. Um, we do real-time code independency analysis while protecting the development cycle. And from an investigation, we gain visibility into the su suggested remediation path. So simple, there's three simple steps and it can be done in three minutes and Dimitri will actually show you this shortly. So we have a continuous vulnerability engine providing fallible and secure code standards. We regularly scan end results to the dashboard. It's very simple and very secure. Step one is subscribe. Uh, step two is enter your code repositories. And step three is view your vulnerability report. We've tried to make this as simple. So again, it's approachable, affordable to anyone. I'm going to walk you through a bunch of checklists because there's, you know, there's literally thousands of different languages. But if you want to use this platform, um, we want to make it simple and make sure you're ready to use it. So it's a great experience for you and your teams. Um, and basically, it's a set of questions. Do either, you know, do you use either of these code repositories, right? So GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, also any externally facing Git code repository, public or private. And there's roughly 14 of them. We support all of them. You know, if you develop in one or more of the languages, um, you know, we're ready to go. Um, you know, one of the big things are software repositories for Java language. We need that compiled, right? And the reason we need it compiled is because if we compile it for you, you're actually testing against our environments and that wouldn't be accurate. So connect your code repositories from your console. And again, Dimitri, so the list of URLs for your repositories will end in Git. Again, for GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. Um, there's also Assembla, Beanstalk, CloudForge, the rest of them on the list. We support all of them. Uh, are they public or private? So if it's public, all you need is your URL ending in .git. If they're private, you'll need a URL and read-only credentials. Uh, which software suppository should I scan? So we essentially say scan all of it. We're not that expensive. And coders can put code in repositories at any time. So it's better to be indexing all, your, all, all of them. So if something happens, you have the visibility. And all it takes is one developer to add code or positive repository to create a vulnerability. From zero to scan results, here are the steps. So you subscribe on csc.nucleus.com. Once you complete your order, receive an email confirming with a confirmation order. Following your order confirmation, you'll see a welcome email from Auth0. They're the industry standard for securing access control. And so we don't do that. We didn't build it. We're using the best one in the industry. Um, after, shortly after your welcome email, you, your account will be created. We create a virtual scanning appliance for you. Uh, you receive an email letting you know when you're ready to scan. You log into your console, add your, get, add your repositories from any of the Gits. Um, you can add your teams. You can have multiple teams and users to many individuals, depending on you know, who manages which uh, re you know, code repository, you can add team members to consoles and repositories, and then scanning will start automatically. You can also do manual scans. From a security perspective, since we're a security platform built by security guys who want to make this easy for everyone, but obviously as the world turns to code, it's the crown jewels. So will we ever copy any of your, soft, your repositories? Nope, the scanner never copies any of your code. 
will it ever make changes to your code? We cannot make changes to your code, but does this suggest remediation strategies to fix vulnerabilities? Your credentials are all encrypted. Nucleus does not have access to your credentials. Again, they, they sit on an authorization platform that we don't have access to. Uh, how long does Nucleus keep my code? We never keep your code in Nucleus. We only take the results of your scans, just summary information or metadata. If you can't your account in Nucleus, we keep your configuration and summary information for 14 days and then we delete everything. So how does your authorization work? It's really, we use Auth0 to secure your accounts. It's the best in the business. It manages everything and we don't see it or have access. How do I know my data safe? Obviously it's critical to us. Code base is constantly scanned for vulnerabilities. We do dog food on our own code. Um, dependencies and bugs and development constantly works to harden the platform. Do you ever see your code? No. Do you have access to your code? No. Uh, is the scanner secure? Yes, it's encrypted. What do you encrypt? We do at rest data and all comms. So what languages, right? So Flex, Go, Java, JavaScript, Node.js, it's so popular that even though it's a framework, we called it a language um, from a marketing perspective. Uh, PHP, Python, and Ruby, and we're adding more. So from a framework, we, we support JavaScript. There's 11 of them there. The most popular are Node and React, followed by Ruby, Ruby on Rails, Angular, and again, the rest of them. So if you code in them inside JavaScript, we can get you results. We also do Flex, Tide is the most popular, but again, any of those frameworks will support. So Java, and again, we ask that we need compiled code for Java, uh, but Spring, JSV, GWT, Play, Struts, we support all of them. We support Go or Golang, depending how people call it. Um, we've listed the top nine frameworks that we support. PHP, another really popular language. So again, Laravel, Symfony, Zend, there's 14 frameworks, support Python, Django, Web2Py, Turbo Gears, again, 11 frameworks inside of that that we can support. And it, you don't have to do any work with these frameworks. There's nothing you have to set up. We do Ruby. So Ruby on Rails is super popular. Phoenix, Sinatra, Cuba, again, nine there. Um, the Git repositories, again, we've just done this alphabetically, but you know, GitHub, Amazons, Microsofts, as long as it's a .git and external, we, we do it. How often do we add languages? We add languages as far as our team is capable of. Um, why do we need compiled code for Java? So for languages like Java, there's no simple way to provide accurate results without being part of the build. So we need the code compiled. Uh, do you scan for dependencies? Yes. Yeah. So it's not only code, but dependencies. And that's one of the things in the market that generally people are either or, and we do both. Uh, what features are in a product? Uh, three simple steps to continue easy sign up. We call it blister time fast to value. You can be up and running and scanning in minutes. We continuously scan your code. Um, if you turn it off, we're going to nag you. And by the way, that will make you NIST not compliant, not conformance. Uh, we map your results to NIST and we categorize results standard, you know, critical high, medium, and low. So what code repositories, again, we support 14 of them. The big ones are GitHub, GitHub GitLab, and Bitbucket. Uh, do we support TFS? It's on a roadmap, no, TA, no ETA. Uh, do you support OWASP? In the near future, OWASP top 10 will be mapped to your vulnerabilities as well. And what SLAs, so we don't have SLAs in the EULA, we describe best effort. If you're dissatisfied with the service, you can cancel any time. And your membership will terminate at the end of the billing period, but we are our true SaaS. If you sign up for a month, you can leave in a month. Um, you get a discount for signing up for a year, but this is true SaaS. Next. How long do we keep data? So we keep your scan results for 30 days, then they're gone forever. We only keep a record of your account for referral and never sell individual data. Uh, how much can you sue Nucleus for? Based on the EULA you agreed to is total liability of one month. Uh, what happens if I have more code repositories than I originally signed up for? The application will prompt you to upgrade your plan as soon as you exceed uh, the allocated number of repositories. Uh, how would I describe Nucleus in a tweet to someone, 140 characters or less, the old, tw the old Twitter? 
So basically, Nucleus continually scans code and vulnerabilities and dependencies in a way that is simple, approachable, affordable, and actionable, and sign up to scanning in three steps. So we get asked this a lot, and we work with teams. Why would you have zero vulnerabilities? A is you have great code, right? Keep scanning new vulnerabilities all the time, and and we up, we update our vulnerability database roughly every 20 minutes. Um, it only contains text or is a blank repo, which happens a lot. Uh, are you scanning Java? If your Java is not compiled, we won't get a result. If you're still having trouble, you know we have a you know we'll come and help. And again, how do you get help? You put in the ticket. You can call. We have up to 24 you know, hour response time. So next slide. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dimitri and Dimitri will walk you through uh, what the platform actually looks like, uh, how it operates, and hopefully you agree that it is really simple to use. Dimitri. Thank you, David. Give me just a second to turn it over to Dimitri. Hey guys, hello, my name is Dimitri Slaviak. I'll be walking you through the simple 30 minute, three step process to sign up, enter your code repositories, and begin your first scan. So let's begin with step one. In your browser, please go to springboard.nucleus.com. Scroll down to the product offering. Here you'll be prompted to select the repository ecosystem that best fits your enterprise and then enter your plan type do you want monthly or annual and then by clicking on buy now you'll be prompted to go to the checkout page where you can create an account enter your billing information and check out so once the checkout process is complete you'll receive a welcome email with a link to your console your username and instructions to reset your your password so this process should take less than 10 minutes to complete and next step you'll be prompted to go to uh, the console so let's go ahead and log in. Uh, as David and Bruno mentioned, we have Auth0 that sits on top of the console to make sure that your account is protected. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter my um, demo account. And as the demo loads, um, our next step is to simply add a user. So we're gonna go into users and we're gonna click on new user. So to add a new user, we are going to go ahead and put in the name the email address. And depending on what your corporate policies are for passwords, you're gonna put in a password for that user. Click on save, I'm gonna do cancel on. So the same process is repeated for all team members. Now, next, let's set up a repository. So we go back to the repository, we're gonna click on add a repository on the top. And here, we're going to go ahead and label the repository. We're going to label it a flaming security mistake. So next, we are going to put in the URL string of the master branch, ending in a dot get. Now, this is a public um, get, so we're not going to use a get username or password. So these are only required for private accounts. And we are going to assign this to the CSE client demo team. We're going to click on save. And there you have it. Um, this creates the repository that we're going to scan. So let's go ahead and click into the repository. And it says no data is displayed, scan now. We're going to click on the blue button and we're going to initiate the scan. Now, depending on the size of your um, repo, this may take a minute, this may take 30 seconds, or this may take several minutes. So while it's scanning, I am going to go in and show you uh, where you can track your progress, which is right here, it's a scanning. So I'm gonna click back into the uh, repositories and I'm just gonna talk about the NIST conformance while this scans. So as David Jamberna mentioned, uh, by using this platform, you meet three of the four um, NIST conformance status. This one is to detect events and understand where the attack methods are, which the report will show. Next one is asset vulnerabilities are identified and documented. 
Next, as detection processes are continuously improved, and lastly, vulnerability scans are performed. Now, the reason why the last um, DECM8 is yellow is because we haven't really performed any scans yet to the repository. Uh, we just entered it, so that's why it's still yellow. So let's go click back here and see if we have any results. And while it loads, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about uh, the different sizes of repositories. Now, depending on your account, this has uh, multiple repositories that this can handle. And if you have three accounts, seven accounts, or a thousand different accounts for your uh, repositories, this can scan it no problem. So again, it's still scanning. I'm going to click back. I'm impatient. And I'm just going to click on the Facebook um, API node. So once the scan is uh, completed, this is what the scan result will look like. There's a trending line that will show you your critical, high, medium, and low. And it will give you based on date of scans. So let's click on the 18th. Um, as you can see, uh, the reports are categorized by critical, high, medium, and low priority. The legend is on top. And the high, critical, medium, and low vulnerability numbers are on top as well. Now, to view uh, the vulnerability, you click onto the vulnerability name. And it tells you, uh, based on the vulnerability, what your remediation steps are and whether or not it's been reported. For example, this step for command injection on the Facebook public API has been reported by HackerOne. Now, the next steps are to download the report by clicking the download button, and this will download your report. Now, at this point, you should be about 25 to 30 minutes, depending on the size of your repos and the size of your team. So next step is if you're having challenges or if there are things that aren't working properly, you can always set up a help desk ticket by clicking on the help desk icon on top. And this will show you here, and this will get you to the help desk send desk. You'll put in your email and password, and then you can set up a support ticket. So this wraps up the demo portion of the console. Great, thanks, Dimitri. So let's take a look before we uh, move to questions. Let's take a look at a quick look at pricing. And I'd like to add a, a couple of statistics to the, the long list that David Jim Bruno gave us a couple minutes ago. Um, a couple more specifically for public safety and government. The 2018 SafeCom Nationwide Survey contains an entire section on cybersecurity. The survey targeted uh, what they term local agencies receiving just shy of 3,000 responses, mainly representing public safety answering points, law enforcement, three EMS, and four fire. Um, and it was over the past five years, two kind of key statistics I wanted to uh, throw out. Over 200 respondents said they have either been severely or had some impact by cyber attacks. 55% said they don't have funding for cybersecurity. And an additional 26% said that their current funding is not sufficient. So in that light, our pricing model for cyber standards check includes a monthly fee, as David mentioned, by repository so that even very small agencies can afford it or at least afford to try it out. As you see, monthly price pricing offers uh, five different tiers, starting from just one to two repos up through an unlimited package. Customers can even start with a smaller tier to start out and then upgrade later as needed. It's a no risk approach to integrating application source code security testing with automation of NIST 800-53 controls. And with that, we'll take a step back and give you an opportunity for questions. Um, what you can do is, I'm watching the attendees. If you have a question, please just raise your hand and I'll unmute you to ask your question. Checking questions that are typed. Any questions from the attendees? 
Can everyone still hear me?